Good morning, this is Steffi and welcome to the Financial Fox. On the show today, I have Matt Goodwin, editor-in-chief of Bitcoin Magazine and author of a new book, The Bitcoin Dollar, an Economic Monomyth. So, over the last couple of months, we have done a series of interviews about Bitcoin and I hope that you have learned something new. Uh, I try to take you to a journey, a discovery journey about this uh, new asset class. And I think today's interview is also quite important because uh, it explores the implication of Bitcoin within the dollar ecosystem and uh, today's society as well, how Bitcoin can be a valuable asset and uh, what are also the friction point and the challenges that we are facing within our economic uh, monetary and financial system. So with pleasure, I'm going to welcome Matt Goodwin to the show. But before we get into, if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, click the subscribe button now and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our news and interviews. And finally, because banking is a big problem for crypto companies, a few words about our sponsors. Greengage provides e-money accounts for small and medium-sized enterprises, high net worth investors and digital assets firms. They leverage the latest technologies, including blockchain, to unlock new funding and liquidity, a game-changing for many SMEs, which are fundamentally underserved by traditional financial services. As a client of Greengage, you will have a dedicated relationship manager, yes, a real person who will listen. And getting started with Greengage engage is easy trust me i've gone through the process myself and it's been really simple and quick so if you are seeking a more personalized experience in managing your accounts in the digital space i generally encourage you to check out green gauge and here is a little bonus for you my wonderful listeners use the code fox10 when signing up to enjoy a 10 percent on the first year's fee on corporate accounts only. The link is in the description, so take a moment to explore what Green Gage has to offer. Now, back to the show. Hi, Mark, how are you? I'm wonderful, Steffi. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, I mean, I want to take some time uh, to talk about your book and also, you know, all the points related to Bitcoin, the dollar, the US, uh, without being too political. But uh, (laughs) perhaps uh, we start with um, a short introduction. Tell me a bit about yourself and when you got into Bitcoin. Yeah, for sure. Uh, So yeah, Mark Goodwin, uh, current editor-in-chief of uh, Bitcoin Magazine, and yeah, just released this book, The Bitcoin Dollar. I I got into Bitcoin, uh, you know, very seriously, uh, like many, uh, at the start of 2017, uh, you know, when everything started kind of to go to go crazy there, uh, price wise, Um, I had been introduced to it. um, You know, I lived in, uh, or I still do, but uh, lived in the Bay Area, you know, for the last decade or so um, in in the San Francisco area in California. And I came across it, um, actually kind of interestingly, the the gentleman who took over for Ross Ulbrich, uh, who started Silk Road 2.0, Blake Benthal, uh, was a regular at my bar. I, I worked in the bar and restaurants. And um, at the end of 2014, you know, just brought up one day that he had purchased a Tesla uh, with Bitcoins, you know, back when that was a a pretty novel thing. No one had Teslas and certainly no one was using Bitcoin to buy them. Um, And he took me around the block in his Tesla and kind of like very briefly explained Um, Obviously didn't mention any of the Silk Road stuff. I found that out later when he was arrested. But uh, kind of briefly explained, you know, this kind of magic internet money and how, you know, he really, uh, you know, the impression that I left from it was that it was this, uh, you know, sort of anonymous uh, payment rail, um, you know, for for buying things on the internet privately, Um, which of course is not exactly true, um, but that was sort of what I I understood it as. Um, And... uh, you know, I think like many, you know, the first time you get exposed to it, it doesn't necessarily click. Uh, and I really didn't even understand that uh, it was an instrument with a with a capped monetary supply or, or even anything that could, you know, 
uh, increase in value. I, I really had no idea. Um, and it wasn't until the start of 2017 when I saw like a headline, you know, it broke 1500 bucks or something. And I was like, wait, it can go up in value? Like, oh my goodness. Um, I thought you could just use it to spend, um, which is very interesting. I think that, you know, that use case really changed uh, as the happenings kind of happened and as we matured into Bitcoin. And now we really look at it primarily as like a store of value, which is kind of interesting, um, and less a payment system. Um, although, of course, people are still working on that, which is great. Um, so yeah, got, got really into Bitcoin, um, you, know, ran, you know, paid attention, watched it, you know, go all the way up in 2017. And then, uh, you know, spent 2018 and 2019 kind of being like, what did I just get myself into? What is this thing? Watching it go down and just crunch. Um, and I just basically spent those two years just like learning uh, and watching, you know, everything I really could. Um, a lot of the Kaiser Report, a lot of um, Andreas Antetokounmpo's uh, videos, um, you know, reading and, you know, really just trying to consume as much content uh, as possible to learn. Um, and then, uh, you know, in 2020, I was pretty prepared for, you know, when the, the lockdowns happened and there was that big price implosion. I uh, was sort of prepared for it and, you know, started teaching and kind of, you know, yelling at all my loved ones, you know, hey, I really think you should check this out. You know, this is a great opportunity. Um, and then spent, uh, you know, the next couple of years kind of uh, just sort of working on Bitcoin uh, in, in, in the background, um, doing uh, kind of like 101s and, and little little teaching things, um, you know, for artists and for friends, for bartenders, uh, and just kind of people uh, in my area that, you know, want, that were interested, um, kind of put together a little like hour and a half little 101. I probably did it like 50 times or something like that. Um, and then that sort of culminated into actually writing. Uh, and I wrote my first piece for Bitcoin Magazine actually two years ago, two days ago, um, which was the Bitcoin, the birth of the Bitcoin dollar, uh, which was sort of a piece that sort of started the thesis um, that eventually led to my book, um, which I just published um, a month or so ago called the, the Bitcoin dollar. And, uh, and then Bitcoin Magazine, you know, they published it. Uh, they pulled me in uh, and I was a staff writer for them for a few months. And then uh, eventually uh, came on uh, full time and was um, the director of editorial for the print magazine, um, which was you know really fun getting to work um, with Joe and AB, the team there. Uh, and then uh, yeah, just very recently uh, was asked to sort of uh, you know help help run the full editorial. Uh, so I've been doing that now for a few months, and um, that about catches you up. Yeah, so uh, here I am, been in Bitcoin now. Yeah, for handful of years and uh you know still feel like i don't know anything uh and learn more every day which is which is so fun um and uh yeah so very interested in the macroeconomic implications of it but also you know really interested in um the freedom tech and and kind of the dev focused stuff um you know i'm, I'm really fascinated by the, the the brilliant minds that are really working and building on bitcoin um, and I think we're about to see a, a, a really big Cambrian-esque explosion of development, um, you know, in, in the next year or so as all these projects and people coming together that really work through the bear market uh, come into fruition. So I think it's a very exciting time to be in Bitcoin uh, and I'm very excited to be where I'm at. I love Bitcoin Magazine and yeah, I get to talk with folks like you and um, yeah, it's all very exciting stuff. Okay, Mark, this is such a very interesting um, journey into Bitcoin, uh, kind of like similar to mine as well. I got in in 2017 deeply, let's say, right. the beginning, you know, you, you kind of learn, uh, then there was the ICO boom, and sure. you know, every, every kind of year that passes, you get to another level of understanding what actually is the Bitcoin revolution. And, uh, you know, you mentioned about Bitcoin as store of value, you mentioned about Bitcoin as money, and I think it's kind of like all of these pieces mm -hmm. and uh, together is really bringing a revolution to, I wouldn't say just the financial system or just the monetary system, but really to our society. And I think you do mention about um, being a variable tools for our democracy and also freedom. So there are so many components that I want to dive deep into with you, but perhaps uh, let's uh, let's start with the book. Sure. So 
tell me what the book is about tell us what the book is about and then uh, you know as you stress on specific aspect then we can maybe uh, unpack them yeah for sure um so yeah the book is called the bitcoin dollar as i said it was sort of um <clears throat> this thesis that i sort of proposed uh at the end of uh you know 2021 in the fall um that basically there was this idea that perhaps um, due to the, you know, kind of monetary debasement of the U.S. dollar, you know, that was occurring with the, you know, the stimulus kind of based on, you know, because of the lockdowns, this, this massive amount of, of monetary stimulus that, um, you know, perhaps there was a, uh, a movement um, to take advantage of the deflationary uh, monetary policy of Bitcoin and sort of this inelastic um, demand. Uh, versus supply, and that perhaps the dollar system um, would would actually try to utilize this this bearer instrument uh, of this deflationary um, Bitcoin asset, um, you know, to to sort of extend its life. Um, and so I sort of made an analogy to <clears throat> basically the petrodollar system that we saw. Uh, you know, obviously there was a lot of a lot of important moments in the in the history of the U.S. dollar and the gold system with, you know, in 1933 with the Bretton Woods establishment and then, you know, uh, you know, up until, you know, basically Nixon in 71 cutting, you know, closing the gold window with the Nixon shock. And we saw, a, you know, a, a pretty big establishment of, of United States military presence in, you know, the Middle East and, and in Saudi Arabia and, and, and Afghanistan and Iran and, and, you know, some of these, um, you know, big producers of oil. And so basically, we, we the U.S. government <clears throat> had established a Basically, not an exact monopoly, of course, but but a but a really strong hold on the uh, basically that you could say the trading pair of uh, of oil um, and making it a U.S. dollar kind of denominated system. So if you wanted to buy petrol, you know, if any if any, you know. European or Asian country wanted to buy oil from the Middle East in order to industrialize, which of course was a huge part of, you know, the post 70s, uh, you know, industrialization of, of nations. Um, you know, you had to buy dollars first, you had to convert from your currency to dollars and then buy oil. So the US basically established, um, you know, a, a, a demand suck for, uh, for the US dollar system as they were entering a highly inflationary period, um, you know, in the 70s. And I made this analogy to Bitcoin that there was this perhaps this uh, similar trend, obviously very differently, you know, maybe not, uh, you know, militaristically, but this creation of a very similar monopoly on the trading pairs and the ins and outs of Bitcoin and crypto, uh, you know, extended, of course. But, you know, the, the extreme, uh, you know, the volume in U.S. dollar denominated trading pairs versus other currencies. I mean, it's 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 97 percent plus, you know, U.S. dollar denominated, um, you know, trading instruments. So I kind of put together this idea that perhaps the U.S. dollar system was preparing to, uh, you know, take advantage of Bitcoin uh, and really, uh, you know, no pun intended, but really tether uh, the dollar system to Bitcoin. Um, by basically recreating this monopoly on the ins and outs uh, of, of the Bitcoin system. If you want to buy Bitcoin, uh, you know, very often than not, you need to buy dollars first uh, or have U.S. dollar uh, banking um, to get them. So obviously, it's again, just like the petrodollar system, it's not a 100 percent monopoly, of course. I mean, you can use the euro and there are other trading pairs, but it's very, very much so weighted towards U.S. dollar denominated stuff. So I kind of put together this idea um, and was, you know, sort of looking at just sort of the, the stats and, uh, and looking at, you know, on-chain metrics and, and dollar metrics and looking at which country held the most Bitcoin. And, you know, you really see this really strong U.S. dollar presence um, in Bitcoin especially, but in the, in the crypto sphere uh, in general. Um, and then I just expanded on that a lot and, you know, really looked at, you know, stable coins being, you know, a huge part of the of the ecosystem. Um, and we're seeing that expanding more and more, um, you know, hundreds, hundreds of billions of dollars in, you know, uh, in stable coins. Um, and I don't see that stopping anytime soon. You know, we just had PayPal release yeah. and Paxos release their PYUSD. So seeing more and more of this developing. And yeah, so I kind of wrote the book as uh, basically it's kind of two parts. And the first part is really a history of the U.S. dollar system. 
uh, a modern history, really, a post-1971 history, um, and looking at the Fed shares and interest rate manipulation and, you know, kind of how the Treasury system works. I think there's sort of a misnomer that the, you know, the dollar is the, is, is the world's reserve currency, but really it's the thing backing the dollar, which are these treasuries. And so to me, Bitcoin is not necessarily poised to replace the dollar as a spending instrument, but it is really poised to replace the treasuries as a reserve asset uh, behind financial systems and, and backing banks. Um, so the first half is sort of, you know, a history of the treasury system, how it works, a look at stablecoin providers, uh, you know, sort of an overall look at this thesis, and then kind of, a, you know, a bit of a warning and a bit of a cookbook, you know, for the future of how Bitcoiners can really be very thoughtful here. Um, and, uh, you know, build, build stablecoin systems that maybe don't rely on treasuries and, and um, you know, really enable Bitcoin to become, uh, you know, this reserve asset uh, that it really deserves uh, or, or, or rather potentially could be. Uh, and then the second half of the book is a little more of a philosophical and technical look at the, uh, it's called the fight for Bitcoin. And it's sort of like, okay, well, if we understand all that stuff, uh, you know, the history of it and how the U.S. dollar system will, you know, try to do everything in its, 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 its capabilities to stay alive, what, what are those actual implications on the humans in Bitcoin? So a little bit about maximalism, a little bit about lightning privacy and scaling solutions, <clears throat> and then kind of wraps up with a sort of just a general, you know, hey, it's, this is money and it's a means to an end. And yes, Bitcoin is incredible and it's wonderful and we should try not to spend it, you know, if, if we don't have to. But also, you know, it's a means to an end and we should use it to build a better world. And if that means you have to spend some of it to, to do that, then, you know, don't listen to the people that say you never should spend your Bitcoin and just take out a bunch of debt and all that. It's like, no, it's okay to use it. It's meant to be used. Um, and that's more or less the book. Yeah, it's um, kind of a two-parter. It's not too long, a couple hundred pages. Um, you know, maybe like a two sitting book, two or three sitting book. And uh, hopefully it just gives you a nice little catch up on uh, all the things that uh, I think are prudent and important, um, you know, as Bitcoin sort of grows into this very mature, important um, financial tool. Thank you. I think that's a great overview. I mean, it comes uh, when you talk to me about the first part. Uh, maybe, I mean, I read uh, Layered Money from Nick Bathia, and uh, maybe many of our viewers also read the book, which is, was great. And it's just giving a good background uh, uh, and understanding uh, how you can actually position Bitcoin and why the current financial system is broken. So I'm glad that you kind of uh, mentioned that. Is that. Do, have you taken a different perspective from Nick? Is there anything that you can say that maybe you are stressing more on? Yeah, I mean, first off, just want to say, you know, I really like Nick a lot. I think he's a, a really nice guy and really smart. Um, I have a signed copy of his book, uh, and uh, actually, when I first posted the the first birth of the Bitcoin dollar piece, uh, when I was literally a nobody, uh, he sent me a message and was like, "This is a really good piece," um, and it was very sweet and supportive. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just have nothing but good things to say about him and his book. I think layered money is really important. I sent it to my dad uh, and asked him to read it, <clears throat> and it's funny. He, he's a, you know he was a former partner at. A pretty big accounting firm now has his own business and you know he sent me this very cute email and he was like man you know I, I had really had no idea how much trust was really in the financial system until I read this book which I thought was very interesting that it's like he's gone through business school and worked in this in, you know very much so in the industry and was kind of taught not to really consider a lot of the trust uh, in, in the in the industry which I think I thought was very interesting but yeah I would say I take more of a um, I think his is much more of a of a of a historical look at uh, you know the the basically the interactions of of the different types of money uh, and gold and and you know treasuries and um, you know paper money and it's it's really this nice technical overview very approachable very readable um, of kind of the history of how coinage and and uh, you know kind of these advancements of technology and money have have developed. Whereas I think mine is, is, is perhaps a little bit more, um, you know, politically focused and sort of uh, coalition focused and looking at the 
um, you know, the players in the dollar system today and looking at the techniques that they've used in the past, you know, to, to basically kick the can down the road and keep the dollar system as basically the economic hegemon of, of the world. Um, so it's a little more, I would say, adversarial, I suppose. Um, you know, I'm not calling anybody out specifically or anything, but I think it's more kind of, a, it's a bit more of a warning um, of, you know, hey, there's, there's a probably a pretty good chance that, you know, Bitcoin will sort of attempt to be co-opted by, you know, these big private capital creation forces. And, you know, we should just be aware of that and make sure that the systems and the tooling that we're promoting aren't necessarily promoting, uh, you know, the continuation of what I consider, you know, a relatively, um, you know, the, the military industrial complex. Let's leave it at that. I'm glad that I'm glad that you you say that I didn't want to be too political. But if we can, if we scrap the surface, sure. is exactly what you said, you know, the the system, the current system, even beneath crypto, even beneath Bitcoin, is still very much focused on how do you get into this system with the current fiat system. So the dollar, basically, that's why stablecoin, they are all dollar peg. You know, there is, uh, there is a problem also, which is a massive problem about banking. Do you need to get into crypto? Well, you still need a bank account to log into these exchanges, change, you know, your assets. Uh, and, and that's a big problem because, you know, just recently JP Morgan Chase in the UK, they put more restriction uh, on uh, crypto transaction. The same with HSBC uh, that now is is putting more limits, you know, it looks like that, I mean, it's getting harder and harder to actually get into the space and, and buy cryptocurrency. So the excuse is obviously we want to protect you from scam, we want to protect you from frauds and, you know, all these kind of things. But there is a really key point that is violated here, which is our freedom, right? And also you mentioned the aspect about trust. So money should be a form of trust and uh, is, uh, is getting a bit more complex right now. Uh, because it's not that there isn't any trust in the current system, but uh, can we say some trust has been lost? I would say so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you look at just sort of what we're dealing with, I think, as, you know, uh, you know, I really consider myself working class and, you know, I came out of the service industry and, um, you know, seeing all my friends deal with, you know, high inflation and rent prices going up and groceries going up. Um, it's, you know, and businesses being closed down and not being able to make payroll and, um, you know, it, it was a really tough time, you know, economically the last couple of years for, you know, the middle and, and working class. Um, and, and that's just in the United States, which obviously has the advantage of having the world's reserve currency that, you know, they probably need Bitcoin the least um, in many ways when you look across the world. So, you know, we're seeing very high uh, levels of inflation and economic debasement, um, which I think is, um, you know, worthy of us sort of, you know, losing trust in some of these traditional legacy financial systems and central bankers um, because they've, they've really, they've abused our trust. Um, we've lost purchasing power of our dollars, uh, of our fiat currency, of our savings mechanisms. We've been blacklisted from, uh, you know, transacting. Um, you know, there's 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 a whole lot of things I think that um, you know we we as you know kind of the people of the world, you know, d you know we deserve better. Um, so I think trust has been lost, and I think also very interestingly, you know, money is really just a technological tool to communicate trust between people. Um, and as if, if that tool is being economically debased and we're not allowed to save and we're not allowed to sort of honor long-term contracts um, because our value, our dollar instrument is being devalued year over year over year and inflation is, you know, well past the 2% target and, you know, inflation rate, it's, you know, I think we need, we need alternative options. But I also think very interestingly enough that financial systems, you know, you can't replace trust entirely with code. Um, and there's a lot of things in the financial system that do require trust, you know, credit and debit and, you know, mortgages and, you know, connecting financial contracts to, to real world things like houses or whatever, you know, those, those really can't be uh, entirely mitigated by code, by ones and zeros. And so we need to create the tools that mitigate 
trust as much as possible um, in these kind of bargaining problems and, 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 and areas. But it can't be completely replaced with code. So I think there's a, a, you know, there's a great, great, incredible use case for Bitcoin uh, specifically you know, within this kind of the bargaining problem between two humans when they want to make a, a bargain and they want to barter. Um, and I think having a unit of account that can't be debased by third parties, and it's really this decentralized, disinflationary monetary policy is, is, is really a state change of money uh, that, you know, no one's ever seen anything like that before. And so I think it has a huge role to play in trust and in rebuilding a new financial system. Um, and and in, 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 you know, as the internet continues to grow across the world, you know, a, a native internet currency, I think is, is a really big deal. And so, yeah, yeah, I think I think trust should have been lost. Trust has been lost, uh, and hopefully, people can can begin to kind of utilize Bitcoin uh, as a tool to help replace some of those uh, you know legacy structures and banking systems and financial systems that we've relied on for you know hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Um, so, yeah, I think trust has been lost, and hopefully, trust can be gained in, in, in new novel instruments. So. Can we, I mean, I'm struggling to see how we can make this work or how that can work. I mean, mm -hmm. Bitcoin as a political money. Sure. Right? How can we make this a reality? Because everyone everywhere is trying to politize. Yes. Look. Politicize. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Politicize everything. Mm -hmm. So how we can keep Bitcoin are political. Yeah, well, it's very interesting to say because I think Bitcoin is both completely apolitical and also the most political instrument I've ever come across. It, it, it's, it's sort of both, um, depending on your framework for what you consider political. There's a great writer in the space, Eric Kaysen, who I highly recommend having on. Uh, he just released a book with Bitcoin Magazine as well. And he talks a lot about this. Um, and he, his argument is that Bitcoin is the most political uh, money that's ever existed because of its uh, removal of the, the special privilege of, of a small few politically chosen people to be able to debt pardon um, and add a wave of a hand or a pressing of a, of a printer, money printer, get to you know, pardon debt. And Bitcoin, you know, doesn't allow that. There's no one that can issue Bitcoin, you know, outside of the consensus rules. Um, anyone can issue it and, and, and also no one can at a whim, um, which, is, which is such a state change. So I think that's a big part of what I wrote about in the book is just being very careful about political forces and, and fiat money um, basically attempting to attach itself arguably kind of in a parasitic way um, to Bitcoin. Um, and that's something that I kind of think the dollar system is doing. And I think, I think Bitcoin really supersedes the nation state in a lot of ways, but also we live in a world that is very dominated by the nation state and by borders and by regulators. Um, and so we have to be able to create alternative systems that don't rely on the same rails that, you know, the legacy banking system has, has relied on for so long and, and internet service providers and, and electrical, uh, you know, generators and, and, and power companies that so many of them are all state controlled. And we've just seen an absolute marriage of, you know, the private banking sector and, and the political world with, you know, bailouts and things that we've seen. It's very hard to sort of even differentiate sometimes between fintech and, 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 you know, the public sector. Um, and I think we just have to be very careful about, you know, really keeping those things at arm's length and letting Bitcoin develop and mature um, and be patient, you know, because I think Bitcoin, you know, we, we have this incentive to do anything to, to sort of let the price go up and pump our bags. And, and, and I think we should be really patient and understand that Bitcoin really isn't about us uh, right now. Uh, it's about creating a system that will work and be fair and give unfettered financial access to, to individuals 400 years from now, you know, our, our grandkids, 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 and, and really not about us, you know, making a bunch of dollars and buying yachts and stuff. It's like, this is a much bigger project. And, you know, I think we just have to be very careful and articulate and, and, consider, and considerate, you know, as we build these tools. So the US dollar and Bitcoin, how they could work together or coexist mm -hmm. as we move forward and also is the dollar actually let's start with that is the dollar losing 
is power. So is the US perhaps not taking the right stance on crypto and is kind of like losing his, uh, you know, prominent uh, status? So then, uh, you know, maybe el somewhere else in the world, Bitcoin can be the champion or can be pushed forward uh, as a case study of reserve currency. I mean, um, it doesn't look like regulation are much better somewhere else, but you know there are some places like Dubai and Hong Kong they are pushing a bit more forward on crypto. Even recently, I've been in in Lugano, which mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you know about it, but you know this small town in Switzerland. Obviously, you know because there is the big Plan B coming up mm -hmm. mid October. But yeah, so there actually you can pay with Bitcoin in many many shops, and mm -hmm. also they have got their own you know token which which is pegged to the Swiss franc, but I think they have been taking really a proactive approach to more incorporating Bitcoin within their financial system. So how is the US dealing with this challenge of, you know, status and, uh, uh, you know, being the leader in the monetary space? And, and then after we can, we can talk about how Bitcoin and the dollar can coexist. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot a lot of the talk of de-dollarization, um, you know, whether there's challenges from, you know, the BRICS system uh, or even Bitcoin or, you know, maybe some gold-backed currencies or, or something like that. I, I think a lot of that is relatively overblown, unfortunately, perhaps. Um, I really don't see the dollar, uh, uh, you know, really being challenged um, in any significant way yet. Uh, from any of these alternative systems. Um, I really think the dollar system is doing just fine. The, the issue really with the dollar system is that it's over leveraged against itself. Um, but I think in regards to its leverage over other currencies, um, I think it's doing just fine. Um, you know, we saw, you know, there's this kind of uh, comparative strength index of sorts, you can call that, that's kind of known colloquially as the Dixie, the DXY. And it's sort of a, you know, the U.S. dollar versus a basket of some of these other, uh, you know, G7, G20 currencies. And the dollar is doing phenomenally well in general. Um, we saw a huge push. Um, you know, we saw a, a multi-decade high, um, you know, last year um, in the fall. And we saw the pound go almost to a dollar parity. We saw the euro go below a dollar parity. Um, and those are really the two big kind of financial currencies um, that really compete with the dollar. Um, we've seen the Japanese yen, you know, be debased, um, you know, pretty significantly against the dollar, you know, and, and obviously the yuan, you know, in China, you know, there's a lot of interesting developments going on there with their own CBDC issuance and all that. Um, but I think for the most part, the dollar is, is, is kind of doing fine relatively to other currencies. The issue is that, you know, there's $33 trillion of, uh, of debt. And how do you pay for that debt when the, uh, you know, you can't raise taxes in this extreme way to pay off the debt and, and, and basically service the budget of the United States, you know, and, and right now the debt service, that's really the problem in this high rate environment. In order to keep people in the dollar system, we've had to raise interest rates. So, you know, raising interest rates, you can look at as, you know, raising the interest of someone being in the dollar system. So if we're paying them more money to hold their their value in the dollar, you know, we get more and more people pouring into the dollar. So we raise interest rates faster and higher uh, than the United States ever has. Um, uh, you know, we were a bit higher in the 80s with Volcker, but not, we, we didn't rise as fast. Um, so what that means is now that because we're paying more out in yield to people to, to buy our treasuries and enter the dollar system, we now have to pay more to service our debt as well. So the debt gets more expensive in debt service payment as interest rates go up. So we're in a, we're in a moment now where our debt is really kind of starting to run away from us. Um, and it's really hard for us to service that debt. And so I, I absolutely think we're going to have to see uh, money printing um, in a pretty significant way in order to, you know, pay off this $33 trillion. Um, when that's going to happen, I don't know. We may have interest rates go up much longer. It could take years. I mean, it's one of those things where who knows. Um, but I'm almost certain that there's a mathematical inevitability that the U.S. government will have to print to eventually service this debt and, and continue to budget the country. So what that means is when we see more money printing and we'll see it each time we print, it's more and more and more. 
you know, what we printed in 2008 was, was pennies compared to what we printed in 2020 and 2021. And, and what we print in 2024 or 2025 or six, whenever it happens uh, is going to be, is going to make, you know, the, the, the pandemic relief look like pennies. Um, and when we see that, you know, we're going to see, we're going to see wild things in, in, in world currency relation. And I think we will see a, an extreme appreciation in Bitcoin, you know, and, and perhaps even gold as well. Although I, I'm not a gold person necessarily, but any sort of hard money standard, I think will appreciate greatly against the dollar if it's printing a lot. Um, but I really look at Bitcoin as being kind of the best asset to, um, to prepare yourself for the monetary printing that will come from basically this runaway debt spiral. So coming back to the Bitcoin and the dollar, how they are going to coexist? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I mean, it's very interesting, right? When we talk about the price of Bitcoin, I mean, we generally talk about it in US dollar price. Again, it's yeah. very American of me to say that, but, uh, you know, that is sort of the general uh, trading uh, metric that we all look at. Um, and there's significant more uh, Bitcoin holders in the United States than than you know, from a from a volume standpoint, a number of bitcoins held, um, the, the majority of them is are in the United States. So I think we'll continue to see Bitcoin being talked about in dollars. Um, I think we'll continue to see a mass expansion of the stablecoin industry as heavily regulated entities and, and the American big four uh, banking system, you know, these private capital groups really move into the sector and start creating their own stable coins. Um, and I think we'll see trillions and trillions of dollars of stable coins issued uh, in the next few years. And um, I think we'll continue to see that symbiotic relationship of of the ins and outs of Bitcoin, when you want to buy Bitcoin, you probably go through a U.S. bank or a U.S. banking instrument or a stable coin. People talk about stable coins as being this sort of banking the unbanked and this freedom tech, I guess, to give people that don't have banking, uh, you know, access to U.S. dollars. But really, all it's doing is giving, you know, charging a fee for you to access some private company's U.S. Bank, right? Like US dollar bank account, yeah. Yeah. which I think is very interesting. Um, and I think we're just going to continue to see, um, you know, the volume of US dollar Bitcoin pairs uh, increase. And, you know, when you want to spend your Bitcoin, I think a lot of people will go back into the dollar and spend dollars. I think it's much easier to price things in dollars than it is in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a very difficult thing to do accounting with, um, to do contracts with, to do salaries with. Um, it's just a little more difficult because of its volatility and, and because of its novelness. I think as Bitcoin gets more and more expensive, that will level out and it will be easier. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to take a salary in Bitcoin or do your books and do accounting in Bitcoin, it's very difficult to plan out what that will look like in three years, four years. Um, whereas with the dollar, I think it's a little bit easier. Um, whether that's, you know, sort of a placebo or not, I'm not sure. Um, but I think we'll continue to just see... Um, yeah, growth in the, the dollar instrument sector. Um, and we'll continue to see, um, you know, appreciation in Bitcoin uh, from a dollar standpoint as Bitcoin matures. So we are kind of like in a middle um, stage situation where there is a two, uh, you know, this all this crypto ecosystem is uh, alongside the fiat system and uh, in the, at the same time, we are getting more and more adoption of, uh, you know, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. So as a mass adoption of Bitcoin is actually happening, so more people are onboarded to the assets. Mm -hmm. How we are moving out of this uh, situation, transitional situation? So my question will be how the space is looking like mm. in... Uh, can we maybe say feasibly like five to 10 years time? I don't know how long it's going to take to get this mass adoption. I think we are still very early. And now, you know, institutions just came in in 2020. So uh, 2021, we can't really say that, you know, in three years we are going to be mass adoption of crypto. I doubt that. And we still, as you, uh, you know, rightly said, uh, we are still in a, in a system where the dollar uh, is key to access the crypto space, to, uh, you know, to get exposure to Bitcoin. But eventually, is uh, Bitcoin going to take a bigger stake and develop into something else 
that just, you know, a niche form of money or a store of value or a speculative assets because some people still allocate, you know, some fund manager put 5% into Bitcoin as speculation because it's going to go up, right? right? What is the future going to look like? Well, I would say, I mean, great question. Uh, a couple things off the bat. Anyone that says they know what it's going to look like is lying to you because no one knows. Uh, no one can predict that. Uh, you can have some ideas, but no one can say for sure. Uh, and then the second thing I would say is it depends on what we choose to make the future of Bitcoin look like. I think there's a lot of demoralization in the space that, you know, you're not allowed to change Bitcoin or you can't build a product or, you you know, it's it's done. Bitcoin's finished. Uh, it doesn't need any more development. Ossify now. Uh, and I and I reject all of that. Um, I, I think Bitcoin has a lot of development left to be done if we want mass adoption. And I think you're absolutely right that we have not even come close to achieving mass adoption. We've a- achieved some pretty wonderful monetization. Um, and it is incredible how much value is in the Bitcoin system and how many people that are, you know, pretty important movers and shakers in the financial world are looking at Bitcoin. But I mean, it's still a very small user base compared to many financial currencies. Um, and also, I think there are just limitations to, you know, let's put it this way. I think the next people, the next big group of people that will come and join Bitcoin, uh, I, I, I think they're going to be pushed into Bitcoin. Um, they're not really going to be pulled. Like I think uh, a lot of the early adopters, you know, were maybe cryptographers or hard money people or, or you know, internet nerds or whatever. And they found out about Bitcoin and they kind of got intrigued and leaned in, you know, like yourself and I. I think the next group of people that really will make a, you know, move the the needle to as we get towards like a billion users, it's like they're going to be pushed towards it because something catastrophic happened in their financial system, in their fiat system, in their banking system. Um, And so I think it's really up to us to build and scale Bitcoin and create these financial services and create the ability for, you know, a billion people to hold, you know, coin, to hold UTXOs and, and to be able to, you know, basically use Bitcoin and view it as permissionlessly as we viewed it, the, you know, the five years, six years, whatever we've been in Bitcoin. Um, so I think it's really up to Bitcoiners to sort of not sit on their laurels, not rest on their hands and 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 go out there and build uh, and get Bitcoin ready for that next group of people that will be pushed to Bitcoin. Um, so I think it's going to look really different than what it looks like now. I don't think it's going to be these niche, hard money, carnivore, toxic Mac. It's going to be like moms and dads and and, and teenagers and college students and business owners and, and people that are going to use Bitcoin as a tool. And they'll have absolutely no care or interest at all in the culture uh, that's established around Bitcoin because to them it will just be a tool. And it is a tool and it should be a tool. And they'll be correct in thinking that way. And I think there's a lot of beauty in the Bitcoin culture and, and a lot of really cool things. But ultimately, I think it's very irrelevant. And the important thing is building the tools that allow people to hold their own coin and, 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 and transact permissionlessly. And if, they can, if we can do that and have Bitcoin ready for when a fiat currency fails or when a country goes to adopt Bitcoin, um, you know, then Bitcoin really has a chance of winning. Um, and, and we'll see what it looks like in five years then. Yeah, you mentioned about the Bitcoin culture and uh, we know there is a strong uh, part of the Bitcoin culture that is maximalist uh, sure. and they see Bitcoin obviously uh, as the only form of money, the only assets um, that, you know, has got a future. Uh, but at the same time, you also mentioned something that resonates a lot with me. People need to go out and experiment. So without experimentation, without people innovating in the space, the ecosystem is going to struggle to thrive. So um, I ran a few interviews over the last uh, couple of months about, you know, ordinals about building web three application on bitcoin about you know all the experimentation um in the bitcoin space and you know you talk to some people they are not really open to that you talk to other people they are really trying to create something that is usable and has got a use case what is your uh, view on uh, you know all the experimentation happening uh, 
in the Bitcoin space? I, I think it's it's incredible. It's necessary. It's important. It needs to be done. You know, Casey Rotomore, who's a Bitcoin developer who created Ordinals, is is a friend of mine. He talked to me about this project for a year before he released it. Um, and I think it's really beautiful. I mean, there's a lot of stuff involved with it in the in the ecosystem that I don't care for. Um, I'm, I don't care about creating tokens on Bitcoin. But I think it's really interesting uh, that it acknowledges what Bitcoin really is, which is sort of a database. Um, and, uh, and, and we're seeing a lot of really interesting developments with eCash, uh, with lightning scaling, with splicing, with, with uh, you know, zero knowledge proof syncing uh, you know, of light clients really quickly so we can establish like a trustless wallet very quickly on a mobile device without downloading the whole chain. Um, you know, other scaling solutions, uh, you know, and kind of federated models. And I mean, we just need everything. Right now, we just need to throw all the spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. And um, I think uh, the, there, there's a beauty in, in experimentation. And I think Casey did a beautiful thing with Ordinals where he sort of broke the, 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 the walls down of like, oh, you need a BIP, you need to go this, you need to go through this process. And it's like, no, it's, it's permissionless, baby. Like, just build it. <clears throat> and I think we're seeing a new, cro a new crop of developers. I think he was part of a new crop of developers. Um, I, think, I think people very falsely, like the Taproot Wizards, very falsely sort of look at Ordinals as being the only thing that, you know, started this whole thing. And, you know, they kind of looked away for a year. And I think there were so many people building incredible things um, that, you know, it was all starting to come out, which I think is really exciting. And, yeah, we need, we need, we need that culture and, and, and we need that. Um, I, I think ossification has become kind of this, this ideal that's misunderstood. Um, Bitcoin's monetary policy should never change. Uh, you know, 21 million happening cycles, you know, 33 epochs, that's it. It, we, it should never change. But we need to be able to create ways to share UTXOs and, and, and have people get unfettered economic access. You know, equity uh, and equality is not a distributed, fair, tokenized system where every single person has the same amount of money in their wallet. That, that doesn't make any sense. You can't have any transfer or volatility between parties if everybody has the same amount. What equality really means is unfettered access to stable monetary policy that can't be changed. And right now, Bitcoin needs to increase its ability to, to let people have access to Bitcoin, whether that's covenants, whether that's, you know, APO sort of uh, lightning extended capabilities, whether that's eCash for privacy, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, but people should be building like hell, building like crazy. Um, don't let anyone tell you you shouldn't build or can't build on Bitcoin um, because they're wrong. Uh, anyone can change Bitcoin. And that's kind of the beauty of it. Um, and that doesn't mean that everyone's going to run your product or run your code or listen to you uh, and maybe they shouldn't I think there's a lot of bad ideas in Bitcoin as well um, but you should be able to build them and do them and if you can convince people to run your code great uh, and if you can't too bad go fork and make your own coin Bitcoin is really special it's it, it's, it's, a, it's a collection of people uh, and and this this consensus around it and um, I think I think people should not be afraid at all to develop on Bitcoin uh, and I really hope people come back uh, to Bitcoin and, and build on Bitcoin and not get kind of sucked into the monetization and tokenization of, of ICOs and of other coins that allow you to fund development. It's like we, Bitcoiners need to support developers, support educators, um, support writers, uh, and, and really push Bitcoin forward using the coin that, you know, they've, they've sort of been so lucky to acquire uh, in this monetization phase. So. Yeah, I say, I say build like hell. I say, I say go for it. Love Don't it, let, love yeah. it, love it, Mark. Listen, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the show. My absolute pleasure, Steffi. Thanks so much.